Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another Lord's Day that thou hast given us. We thank thee that thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to thine own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We thank thee that thou hast given us thy spirit. We thank thee for the fellowship that we have in the truth, which is the only basis for any fellowship that's ever existed. We thank thee that thou hast set apart this day uh, out of the other um, six and hast sanctified it unto thy glory and hast sanctified it unto the benefit of thy people. So we pray for thy people this day. We pray that the word would go forth not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. We pray that thou wouldst continue to raise up men to stand for the truth and against the lie, because upon this rock, which is to say the truth of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we believe that thou shalt raise up again thy church, and we believe that thou shalt raise up men to preach the truth, and we pray to that end. Pray that thou wouldst be with us this day. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're looking at this wonderful passage of Hebrews, the faith chapter, which is as it were, the gasoline on which the engine runs, the engine of not only our justification is through faith, salvation past tense, salvation from the guilt of sin. We talked about that um, past tense salvation that God, we remind ourselves that we got here uh, through Isaiah 52, 7, say unto Zion, thy God reigneth, and our God reigns uh, through the scepter of his law, and therefore we are brought to uh, an understanding that in Adam we fell into the estate of the guilt of sin, salvation past tense is salvation from is a justification, which is salvation from the guilt of sin. Salvation present tense is how God marvelously, once again, through the scepter of his law, not only brings us to the realization of our guilt through his law, but the marvelous thing is that through reconciliation to his law uh, in a, a graduated sense, we are brought more and more to die unto sin, and to live unto righteousness. And we look forward to that day. This is present tense salvation, uh, sanctification, salvation from the power and pollution of sin, and we look forward to the day uh, of future tense salvation, which is the state, uh, the time at which we shall be delivered finally from the very presence of sin. Future tense salvation, glorification. And so we are looking at verse 19, uh, accounting. Let's start with verse 17 again. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac, shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Last week we were, we spoke about this concept of the last part of the verse that Abraham uh, received Isaac in a figure. And 
If you thought it was difficult to follow, it was difficult for me to follow. Uh, but it's a wondrous concept, as I hope we are at least beginning to see. And note carefully that we, as we pointed out last week, the text does not say that Abraham received Isaac back in a figure, though it is true that since Abraham was given obedience to the command of God to sacrifice Isaac, in his mind, Isaac was already dead. And so he did, in a sense, receive him back, but the text doesn't say he received him back in a figure. And we believe that it is much deeper than that. God saw to it. If we meditate on exactly what happened in the case of Abraham and his son from the very beginning, God saw to it that Abraham understood Isaac never belonged to him. Isaac was a miracle. Isaac was a gift of God. Uh, Isaac was something that was brought about, as we are told in Romans uh, 4, uh, 18, that he calleth those things which be not as though they were. And uh, we think of the case of Samuel and Hannah. Let's look at that for a second. In comparison, by way of comparison to Abraham and Isaac, chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, Hannah's prayer, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Isn't it interesting? that, as in the case of Abraham and Sarah, uh, uh, Hannah was also barren. And yet she had such a concern for the covenant, for God's salvation, that she prayed that she be given uh, a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. So, uh, as in the case of Abraham... Samuel never belonged to her, and indeed, her prayer was that he be given her for the sake of the covenant, and that uh, she would give him back to God. Um, and so, we see that Isaac always belonged to a different realm, not the realm of this world, but the kingdom of God, the realization of the promise which was to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told in Galatians 4, which is, which is what we're looking at in our Bible study, and speaking of this different realm, that there are two covenants uh, related to Abraham. And one is the covenant that we can see. Uh, and that is the covenant of Hagar which we'll see this in a second. The, the visible covenant, secondly, the invisible covenant. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5 that we walk by faith and not by sight. You see the antithesis. I was recently asked, what is the antithesis? <laughs> what is the antithesis? The antithesis is everything. We walk by faith and not by sight. Grace is opposed to works. Darkness as opposed to light. Cursing as opposed to blessing. And so the two covenants, the one antithetical to the other, the covenant concerning the bondwoman, Hagar, and the other covenant concerning the free woman. See that? The end of this is the bondwoman, Hagar, the free woman, Sarah. And interestingly enough, uh, Galatians 3.10, 
For as many as are of, look at that verse. Turn to it right now. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. The covenant of the curse under Hagar. The covenant of the blessing under Sarah. Notice that word of in some of the modern translations of the Bible totally leave that word out and is exactly, literally what it says. As many as are of the works of the law. They belong to the works of the law. They belong to Adam. They belong to the covenant represented by Hagar. Um, and so Isaac, from the very beginning, was invisible to Abraham because Abraham walked by faith. God saw to it that this should be the case. And then Abraham's wife, uh, interestingly enough, um, I guess you could meditate on that quite a while, uh, that Abraham's wife uh, came up with a bright idea. Even though Abraham was the free woman, Hagar, the bond woman, came up with a bright idea, which many women uh, come up with, not only today, but throughout the course of history. Um, Eve came up with a bright idea. And many of the cults, many of the heresies throughout Christian history were started by women coming up with bright ideas. And so Sarah suggests that you can, that, that we can, that we, we can work it out. We can work it out. We can work out the promise through our own machinations. Uh, yes, uh, we can work it out through Hagar. Let's look at that uh, statement in Galatians, which we should be coming up on in the near future in our Bible study, in which we are in chapter 4. But beginning with verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. You see it? But he who was of the he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. You see that? And so Ishmael, born of the we're all Ishmaels from birth. We're born of the bondwoman. We're of the works of the law, but he of the free woman was by promise. See, Isaac, uh, through Isaac shall thy seed be called. The promise in Christ. Which things are an allegory, Paul tells us. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. The covenant uh, represented whose progenitor was Adam. And the other covenant was in Christ which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in, is in bondage with her children at the time of the Apostle Paul. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. You see that? Jerusalem is above. It doesn't belong to this world. It's free which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren. Now, who does that refer to? Of course, it has to refer to Sarah. Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. So, uh, the Westminster Divines were so wise in their understanding of this fact that there are, which, I mean, basically, it's clear in the Scripture. Uh, there are two covenants. The covenant of Sinai, which at the suggestion of Sarah, though she was the free woman at her suggestion, 
The covenant of Sinai is the do-it-yourself covenant. Covenant of works. The natural man. Uh, I can work out. The covenant of Sinai says this. I can work out a righteousness of the law. And I can be accepted by God through such working out. Uh, Cain belonged to this covenant. He uh, offered a sacrifice to God, which, is, which was of the law, which was of his own doing, and which was from Adam. And l listen to this statement by Luther, which is so close to the idea we're talking about. This is the sum of the doctrine of the devil and the world from the beginning. We, this is the covenant of Hagar. We will not appear to do evil, no, but whatever. It's all characterized by hypocrisy, the whole thing. There's nothing that the child of God hates any worse than hypocrisy. We will not appear to do evil, but whatever we do, God must approve of it. And all his prophets must agree. If they do not, let them die. Let Abel perish and Cain live. Let this be our law. And so it is. And so it is today. Same thing. I'm a good person. So, uh, my works, as Cain thought, my offering must be accepted by God. And it must be accepted. What did we say before? That Cain's offering... Uh, wasn't so much rejected because it was an offering, though it was rejected because it was not what God required. But primarily speaking, Cain's offering was rejected because Cain was rejected. That's the rub. So the covenant of Sinai, everything about Sinai is this worldly. And as we just saw, everything about uh, the second covenant is the covenant of the free woman is heavenly. Uh, recently, I've been uh, reading books and articles concerning a reformed leader of the 20th century. And one of his uh, major emphases, if not his, I would posit it as his major emphasis of his entire ministry uh, was the primacy. In fact, he wrote a book. It was either a book or a pamphlet entitled The Primacy of the Intellect. And one of the reasons is that the Baptists got us, thanks to the Baptists, got, into, got us into an intellectual morass. Uh, and so... These men uh, came up with this, I believe, as a reaction to that. Uh, our country, America, has been described as a nation of rugged individualism. You see that? Rugged in that's not a that's not a compliment. That's a uh, that's a criticism. And I remember when I was a kid, my father used to say frequently, "Every man for himself." Um, Freudian slip. So, Baptist theology has gotten us into this intellectual morass. And so a group comes along, um, I would say primarily owing to this uh, major leader in, re in the Reformed Church during the 20th century, and they see this problem of the intellectual morass into which we uh, fail. Uh, and they said that the promise, the, excuse me, the problem is a lack of uh, intellectual acumen. And so the solution is to place emphasis on intellectualism, intellectual achievement. But the Baptist confusion was not the problem, but only a symptom of the problem. The problem isn't intellectual, this intellectual morass. And this, 
this uh, uneducatedness of the populace. Uh, the problem is Sinai. And individualistic thinking is only a manifestation of the problem, which is an emphasis on self. But we see that this reaction to the uh, intellectual incapability uh, was, was a wrong reaction. And uh, just as in the physical realm, in the natural realm, if you treat the symptoms rather than the disease, you come up with the same type of disaster as you do in the man. You treat the symptoms of a physical disease. Instead of the disease, you end up in the death of the person who has the illness. And in the spiritual realm, if you treat the symptoms rather than disease, that's, that's where you end up. Uh, in the death of the victim. And we're... we're going very quickly into the death of the church. But we believe by faith that the church is not going to die, as we just mentioned. Upon this rock of the gospel, upon this rock of the free one, the promise through Isaac, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But in the present time, we're treating the symptoms. And this man who is known for his emphasis on the primacy of the intellect suggested. As this is a curse, because what is it that man takes more pride? Think about this. What is it that, that every man or any man takes more pride in than intellectual achievement? And so we have it. It brings with it a curse. And so this man suggested that we read a book written by perhaps the most pernicious heretic in the entire 20th century for pointers on sanctification. That's how much this emphasis, this primacy, that's where this primacy of intellect leads us. It's a treatment of the symptoms rather than the disease. Rather than seeing the sanctification as John 17, 17, the, Lord, the words of our Lord himself says, Sanctif the, the, in his high priestly prayer unto the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This primacy of intellect, man, suggests that we be sanctified through the lie. The curse of intellectualism. So an emphasis on intellect is not only not a solution to the problem, but it is part of the problem itself because it is under the rubric of Sinai. Sinai, once again, represents human achievement. Sinai is the idea that I can do it. Sarah comes up with this bright idea to realize the covenant through another means. And so we have two covenants. The first covenant is under Hagar, uh, who is described as the bondwoman, as we just said. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Personal achievement is cursed by God. Second covenant is the covenant described as being under Sarah, the free woman. Hagar, the bond woman. Sarah, the free woman. Hagar represents human achievement. Or we could say, as we've said time and time again in the past, uh, this covenant under Hagar is a covenant of do, do, do. But the covenant under Sarah is a covenant of humility, which is a covenant of done. The covenant of Hagar is a covenant of works. The covenant of Sarah is a covenant of grace. You see the antithesis everywhere in Scripture. The two circles, remember we haven't mentioned those two circles in quite a while. The Venn diagram, where you have two overlapping circles, uh, one, the part that doesn't overlap is 
and specific to this group, and the, on the right, the other circle, which doesn't overlap, is specific to the other group, and the overlap is what the two groups have in common. However, in this Venn diagram, there is no overlap. That's the point of the antithesis. So, the covenant of Hagar is a covenant of works. The covenant of Sarah is a covenant of grace. Um, we said that the covenant of uh, Sarah is faith in God's power. Remember that? Uh, and that's why uh, Sarah was barren. Faith in God's power to bring about the realization of his promise. And the other covenant is faith in the power of man. So we see the antithesis. Now how are Hagar and Sarah related to us today? The physical barrenness of Sarah brought about the, ne the necessity of Abraham to believe in God's power. You see that? It wasn't an accident that Sarah was barren because it brought about the necessity of Abraham to believe in God's power. How could he believe in his own power to bring about the realization of the promise when both he and when he and Sarah could not physically come up with a realization of the promise. And in our age, uh, it is, as the saying goes, a twist of fate, we would have to say, a twist of providence. In our age, our age is the fecundity. When I was a kid, not so much today because we've gone so far down, but the fecundity or the fruitfulness of evangelism, personal evangelism, uh, remember the uh, um, the Armenian vision of multiplication that I uh, pointed out. This was come up with by the Navigators Parachurch organization. The vision of multiplication, the uh, fecundity of both personal and crusade evangelism, the fecundity, the fruitfulness of personal and crusade evangelism, the vision of multiplication is that you, you personally lead two people to Christ and in turn, those people lead another two people to Christ and so forth and so on. It's just so you see the vision of multiplication. But this, is, this belongs to the realm of Hagar because it is nothing other than personal achievement. And so we could say, we could say it this way, the fecundity of evangelism has resulted in the barrenness of the church. How could it not? Because it's in his emphasis on personal achievement. We should have seen that this barrenness was inevitable. But as we've said recently, this apostasy has been going on for longer than my life, at least 125 years. So Abraham had to believe in the realization of God's promise through a barren wife at the time when children were seen to be blessings. Today we live in an age of industrialization where children are seen as curses. You see, it's sort of, like we said, a twist of fate, a twist of providence. You see the difference in a sense in a superficial way. The opposite. Uh, wh whereas in the time of Abraham, children were seen as a blessing. And he couldn't have children. Now in the age of industrialization, children are seen as a curse. <clears throat> I was thinking of Matthew 5.10 where Christ says the words of our Lord to his apostles, Go not in the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think that we need to, at least in our minds, return to a realization of that statement. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house 
of Israel. You see, uh, the Gentiles have already been brought in. And so it is a wrong emphasis, this emphasis on personal, uh, uh, once again, by way of disclaimer, I have no problem with a personal evangelism. But there is most definitely, and over, or has been, once again, we've gone so far now that this doesn't even exist. This overemphasis on personal and crusade evangelism. Hagar represents personal decisions. Sarah represents household salvation. We were talking about this yesterday. This Baptist concept. Baptist theology is a curse. This Baptist concept of individualistic salvation. God saves individuals, but God's salvation is not individualistic. It's covenantal. Not only do they see salvation uh, individualistically, they see the church, and they take pride in saying uh, that the church is on the autonomy of the local church. And they see Scripture as containing not a whole teaching, but scripture tapes containing thousands of individual verses. So, um, there, this emphasis on personal evangelism, or I would say overemphasis on personal evangelism, contains many curses, one of which being this. Think about this. When you street preach, or you personally evangelize somebody that you don't know, it is much more difficult to see the total depravity of these people. Much more difficult than it is in your own household. I was thinking of, um, so that's one of the curses of overemphasis on personal evangelism. You're out on the street. You see this person for 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, how long or time you spend talking to them. And then they're gone. Uh, I was thinking of Ezekiel chapter 37 in light of this, which as we know is the valley full of bones. Let's look at Ezekiel 37, beginning with verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. Isn't that interesting? It has to be significant. What bones are there of people that have died years before that are not dry? But there's an emphasis on that. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? That's where we are today. Or haven't we come face to face with that? Can these bones, can the church be revived? It's impossible. As far as man is concerned. If you're involved, if you're talking to people, if you're engaged in thinking and activity, you can see this so clearly. It, it's impossible. They're very dry. And said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? The answer is no. But with God. There it is. Ephesians 2. But God. All things are possible. And I answered, O oh Lord God. He answered in faith. Right? He knew the hopelessness of the situation. They were very dry. O oh Lord God, thou knowest. That's his answer. Then we fast forward to verse 11. <clears throat> then he said unto me, Son of man. These bones are the whole house of Israel. They're not just bones. And they're not just dry bones. Bringing about the impossibility for them to revive themselves. 
or to be revived by some work of man. But they are the dry bones of the house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. There it is. See the impossibility? Our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. See, um, there's an entry right there. Cut off for or cut off from our parts. This emphasis, do you see it? You see how the Baptist idea comes in once again? Individualistic autonomy of the local church. Individual scripture verses. No systematic theology. We're cut off from our parts. No concept of rational thought. And intellectual, and, and uh, the primacy of the intellect is just another reflection of that. Brings with it a curse, as we have seen. So if this is a metaphor in Ezekiel 37 for the way that God works in salvation, and it must be. Because God is immutable. He doesn't work individualistically. He does not primarily work through personal evangelism or crusade evangelism. I am the Lord, I change not. Verse 4 tells us, once again, look at verse 4. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O oh, Ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. There it is. Prophesy to these bones. An overemphasis on street evangelism and crusade evangelism is evangelism not to Israel but to the world. And this curse has resulted in a phenomenon in which the heathen in our country don't even understand the English language. Is it, is it, it, are the bones dry? This friend of mine on, online recently went out, he's a young guy, <laughs> went out and read some Puritan book out in the open air. And... Uh, I asked him, did you give him a refresher course in the English language before you read the book? Nobody understands that English. Might as well be speaking Swahili. It's sort of like me going to downtown Taipei, Taiwan, and reading Shakespeare in the middle of the street and expecting somebody to understand. It's not going to happen. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritan. Enter ye not, but go rather... Go rather to the lost sheep of the Hagar and Sarah. Hagar, emphasis on the individual, emphasis on personal achievement, emphasis on we can work it out. We can work it out. Hagar, come over here. We can work it out. We can bring about the realization of the promise ourselves, which brings with it a curse. So the first point. Under this chapter, which I believe is an excellent illustration of this idea, going back to Hebrews 11, from whence also he received him in a figure, Isaac, which was the son of the promise, which was son, the son of the free woman. As opposed to the bondwoman, Hagar. So the first point we're using Ezekiel 37 as an illustration of this point. That Abraham received Isaac in a figure. Our first point is that instead of personal and street evangelism, which Hagar represents, we have here prophesy unto the house of Israel. Let's look at, look at it again. 
And he said unto me, verse 3, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, Say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And secondly, first of all, prophesy to Israel. Secondly, prophesy to the bones of the house of Israel, not to the heathen. Isn't that interesting? Verse 11, once again, then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Prophesy to the house of Israel. Thirdly, verse 4 tells us the message of this prophecy. Again, he said unto me, Say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. There it is. The message of the prophecy. First of all, we said it is a prophecy unto Israel. Secondly, a prophecy unto the bones of the house of Israel. You, you see that? We prophesy to Israel, firstly. Secondly, he says we prophesy to the bones of the house of Israel. See, to prophesy unto the heathen is to prophesy unto the bones of the heathen. No, we prophesy to the bones of the house of Israel. They're dead. They're disconnected. Thirdly, what is the message? We prophesy to Israel, first of all. Secondly, we prophesy to the bones of Israel, not to the heathen. That's God's manner. God saves his people in the line of continued generations. I'm the Lord, I change. He doesn't change. The Gentiles have been brought in. That's the only difference. The prophecy, the, the promise is unto you and to your children, Acts 2.39. And as many as are afar off and by good and necessary consequence to their children. So when the Gentiles come in, salvation, the way of salvation doesn't change. The only thing that's changed is now salvation is not limited to ethnic Israel. But everything else is the same. God saves his people still in the line of continued generations. And so we prophesy to Israel. We are the circumcision. We're not dispensationalists. We, dispensationalists, the, what do we say? The pronoun in the Baptist thinking is you, singular, covenantal, biblical thinking. The pronoun is first person, plural. We are the circumcision. That's prophecy to Israel. We are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice. What did we say yesterday? Bet your last dollar on it. Every single false gospel is a gospel of carnality. We are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So first of all, we prophesy to Israel. Secondly, because God saves his people in the line of continued generations. Secondly, we prophesy to the bones of the house of Israel. There's no hope. Thirdly, the message. We're not... Thirdly, brings in the idea that these bones... An emphasis. You should know to begin with the bones. If, if he's prophesying, if these people have died years and years ago, they're already dead. But you see the emphasis on dry bones. And with respect to the house, the whole house of Israel, we 
The Christian pronoun, the biblical pronoun is first person plural. We are the circumcision. And so an emphasis in the family on this is what we use. I mean, this is another indication. There's no hope. And this is the indication we're talking about. The idea and the practice of what we call corporal punishment. Corpus means body. Punishment of the physical body. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And the rod, the physical rod of physical correction will drive it far from him. That's what we're talking about. The physical rod. Now, this could, this could only, think about this rationally, this could only work in the house of Israel among God's people. For those of you, as some guy likes to put it, in Rio Linda, this is talking about spanking. Number one, spanking teaches the house of Israel. You can't spank other people's kids. Is that clear enough? Hey, you, we're in danger of getting, in, uh, getting into trouble spanking our own kids, at least in the state of California already. You can't even spank your own children. But you can't spank other people's children. Secondly, it teaches the house of Israel, corporal punishment, say unto Israel, the, to the bones of the house of Israel. It teaches the house of Israel that these bones are dry. What do we mean by that? If you practice corporal punishment consistently, you are teaching your covenant child who has yet to be regenerated, by the way. You are teaching your covenant child. If you practice it consistently, he's being spanked for the same offense five times in the same week. You're teaching him he cannot change. He hates spanking. He can't stand the pain of it. But you're teaching him not only that, these, that this is the house of Israel, that these are the bones of the house of Israel, but you're teaching him that these are dry bones. Deuteronomy 8.3. That's one of my, I hope, I hope some of you have memorized this verse. Deuteronomy 8.3. Same idea. And he humbled thee, the house of Israel, and suffered thee to hunger. See? He humbled thee. Those are bones. And thee is the house of Israel. And suffered thee to hunger. Caused you to see that these bones are dry bones. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. No, you're not going to come up with it. Neither did thy fathers know. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. The word being the Lord Jesus Christ. So, firstly we said, it is a prophecy unto Israel. Secondly, to the bones of the house of Israel. Thirdly, the message. It teaches the house of Israel and the dry bones in the house of Israel. Um, it teaches not only that they are dry bones, but thirdly, under this uh, point of the message that we are to prophesy to the house of Israel. Westminster Shorter Catechism, number 24. Christ's prophecy comes out of the mouth of the prophet. How does Christ execute the office of a prophet? In revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. By his word, the proclamation of the law, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but
but of the Spirit. For the letter kill it. But the Spirit giveth life. We're going to get to the Spirit in a minute. But we do. Start with the letter. Start with the law. And this uh, makes us think of another verse. Very close to this passage that we're looking at. In Ezekiel 37. Just four chapters earlier. Which tells us. What exactly the message is that we are to prophesy to the house of Israel, to the bones of the house of Israel, yea, to the dry bones of the house of Israel. Ezekiel 33, verse 8. When I say, this is God's prophecy. You don't prophesy what you want to prophesy. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, and verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word in my mouth and warn them from me. When I say, your prophecy is God's prophecy. When I say, unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. That's dry bones. No ifs, ands, or buts unless you make your personal decision. No, 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 no. O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. What do we say in Ezekiel? The same, the same book. Is it any coincidence? Chapter 8, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also is the soul of the Son. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Unless. No unless to it. O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. And that message drives the bones, yea, the dry bones of the house of Israel drives us to the death of Christ because, O oh, wicked man, thou shalt surely die. And all of God's people die in the death of Christ. The greatest work I know of on the death of Christ is called the death of death in the death of Christ. Do you see it? Thou shalt surely die. We died in our surety, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the preaching of the message is to say to Lazarus, O oh, dead man, Come forth out of the grave. It is to say in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 that we just alluded to, I do believe, uh, that God calls those things which be not these dry bones, as though they were. Or 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And not only the message that is to be proclaimed to the dry bones, but fourthly, in speaking to the whole house of Israel, notice once again, so we believe not only in plenary, um, you know the distinction between plenary inspiration and verbal inspiration. Plenary inspiration is the idea that the whole of Scripture is the Word of God. But verbal inspiration says that every word, not just the whole idea in Scripture, the whole, not just the whole message is inspired as an infallible, but every single word. And we see that another instance of that here, where he says, in verse 4 again, Ezekiel 37, 4. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word. Singular, not plural. You see it? Hear the word of the Lord. It's not doctrines of grace as we hear constantly. It is doctrine of grace. It is the word of the Lord. It is the message. It is a unified message. As the robe of Christ, the Puritans used to say, which was seamless from top 
to bottom. And that's why the old Puritans divines and the old uh, Orthodox theologians used to say all five points of the gospel stand or fall together. You can't believe one and deny four. You can't believe four and deny one because it's a unity. Look at Ephesians 4. Listen to this statement. Go with verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Go with verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. You see it? Hear the word of the Lord. Not words. One message. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So, the word of promise, which is Christ. Everything is Christ. That's the reason why we say, once again, the, the, the central point of the five is the ill, the atonement of Christ. So in preaching, we're tre- preaching to dry bones. We're tre- preaching to the dry bones of the house of Israel. We're preaching the promise of Christ, which hope comes through total despair once again. And this preaching to dry bones, let's review that part of it, is a preaching of total depression. You see that this is the unity of the faith. As found in Ezekiel chapter 37. Preaching to dry bones is preaching total depravity. Corporal punishment is preaching total depravity. Secondly, preaching to the dry bones of the house of Israel is unconditional election. You see that? The Israel of God is the, are the elect of God. Preaching to dry bones is preaching total depravity. The unity of the faith. Secondly, preaching to... The bones of the house of Israel is preaching unconditional election. And preaching the word of promise. The word of promise is preaching Christ. Limited atonement. So hope comes through total despair. The question which was asked in the beginning of the chapter. Can these dry bones live? The answer is no. With man, it is impossible, but with God, with Isaac, you see, who was a miracle of God, all things are possible. As Peter said in his message, you killed the prince of life. But Christ is only the prince of life to dry bones. And then finally, back to Ezekiel 37. Getting to verse 5, verse 4 again. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. You see? Isn't that interesting that we just got to the uh, question 29? Uh, How is this applied uh, to the saints? It's through the Spirit. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. That's the work of the Spirit. So you see that dry bones, total depravity. 
Dry bones of the house of Israel. Unconditional election. The promise of Christ. Limited atonement. Now we have what? You see it? Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. The wind bloweth where it listeth and ye hear the sound thereof, but you do not know from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the wind. The same word for wind is the word for spirit. And so, our only hope is in the application of the Holy Spirit of the redemption purchased by Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another time together. We thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the message that thou hast given us, the unity of the message. We thank thee that we have been brought, that we were the dry bones that have been brought to life and all the ligaments and the bones have come together with the muscles because it is a unity of truth, which is our only hope, which is unity in the truth, which is the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.